Hello! Today I'm taking a brief look at the music of Final Fantasy, and the lasting impact the compositions and composers involved have had on not just the series itself, but more broadly within the video games industry and beyond. And I'll caveat by saying firstly, uh, I apologise in advance for my Japanese pronunciations, and secondly, if you find yourself enjoying the episode, I'm always grateful for a share and a subscribe, uh, and if you'd like to support the channel further, you can do so by checking out the links in the description. Now, turning to the music of Final Fantasy, the mere mention of it probably conjures an image of Nobu Uematsu to the mind of most fans, and he's rightly synonymous with Final Fantasy, having been associated with the games since the first instalment back in 1987, right through to the present day in a range of capacities. And indeed, while he has worked in a significantly reduced capacity since about Final Fantasy X, his legacy endures, not least because several key themes, such as the Chocobo theme, the Victory Fanfare, and the Final Fantasy Prelude, still to this day appear in most games. And much like the currency of Gil, or, or a character called Sid, Uematsu's staple themes remain one of these fleeting unifying factors that bring the disparate worlds and settings of all the different Final Fantasy games together. So... Uematsu and his compositions were hugely influential, and it's in no small part thanks to series creator Hironobu Sakaguchi and his approach to game design, and his willingness to collaborate and, and offer creative freedom to experts in their field, which led to Uematsu and others such as concept artist uh, Yoshitaka Amano to take ownership of their work and really bring their ideas and influence into the final product which makes Final Fantasy historically so distinct from its peers, I think. And in an industry that's dominated by the creative compromise of production teams or driven totalitarian auteurs such as Hideo Kojima, which is not a criticism of Kojima because I love his work, it just shows by contrast uh, what a trusting approach Sakaguchi was taking with his team, uh, particularly on a title that was famously a final gamble on his involvement with video games. Other factors that make Uematsu's work stand out, uh, among others in the field, is firstly his early attentiveness to emotive and thematic aspects of both character and story, which we really started seeing at around Final Fantasy IV, and in a time before voice acting or graphics that could really communicate a character's body language or expression or emotion, Music and sound design was perhaps the single most essential aspect of the game experience uh, in terms of emotional communication with the player. And just a random example that springs to mind is where in Final Fantasy VII we have the scene where Sephiroth is reading the Genova reports in the Nibelheim mansion and he suddenly realises that he's this product of genetic experimentation and he's not human. It's not the, the boxy polygonal avatar of Sephiroth, you know, pacing up and down, nor is it the pre-painted backdrop that really carries the emotive weight of this scene, but rather it's the silence that is broken by Uematsu's tune, uh, those chosen by the planet, that really crafts the impact and conveys this memorable scene where Sephiroth finally breaks uh, and it's his turning point into villainy. Secondly, Uematsu is infamously a musician and composer for which there are only two types of music, which is good music and bad music. And it's this open-minded approach uh, which is hugely important when considering his musical oeuvre, because where video games have evolved from a primordium of basic trance-like chiptune beats uh, that early on you know, took inspiration from classical music, uh, for example, you know, Tetris, uh, early iterations of that game used Tchaikovsky, um, a very basic beat uh, of a Tchaikovsky tune. And then the, the very famous Tetris tune uses um, a Russian orchestral piece, a uh, folk tune, I can't remember what it's called offhand. But basically this shows that very early on the industry was pursuing this idea of pure classical and, and largely following in the footsteps of cinema in the idea that music rooted in classical orchestrals will ensure that games appear timeless um, and aren't dated by genre music. 
you know, unless of course they are genre games such as Red Dead Redemption or Assassin's Creed and the historical inflections that those games sort of have and, and require with their soundtracks. So in light of this and, and turning to U- Uematsu, he has historically proven unencumbered by a desire to align with the trajectory of either cinema or video games. And that's certainly not to say that he doesn't produce compositions rooted in classical, because you don't get a nickname like the Beethoven of game music for nothing. But it is his willingness to experiment and draw broadly on musical inspiration from the earliest days of Final Fantasy that really helped distinguish this series and and set it apart. Uh, And everything from smooth jazz through to, you know, Celtic folk to heavy metal can be heard through the chronology of the series, you know, in various places. And once again, uh, it is Uematsu's ability to unify music to a theme, uh, a character or a mood, rather than a uniform set of instruments that makes him so historically significant to Final Fantasy uh, and the game industry, I think. And just to double down on this before moving on and looking beyond his compositions uh, on games, on the Final Fantasy games themselves, his formation of the Black Mages rock band in the early 2000s, um, the Final Fantasy piano collection albums that were later released, and of course the Distant Worlds classical concerts, you know, are all a testament to his openness and his malleability as a composer. And while it's now commonplace to see amateurs or enthusiasts and YouTubers performing adaptations or covers uh, of famous music, it is much less common to find the composer themselves, you know, reimagining their own work so consistently across a broad range of genres and mediums. And even today we are seeing Uematsu work with new staff members and young musicians to adapt and augment his work uh, for the Final Fantasy VII remake. And I think that enthusiasm and generosity with his material is um, an understated testament to his character and his work ethic. Now, charting the chronology of Final Fantasy's music is best viewed with some historical context in mind, because it's not so simple as to say that Uematsu improved or found his style as a composer you know, over the course of time, but two things happened through the passage of time which informed his work. Uh, Firstly, and most obviously, uh, technology improved uh, and permitted more advanced applications of sound and composition uh, to game cartridges and then later with CD quality music when the Sony PlayStation came along. But secondly, and perhaps more importantly for his output, is that the settings and the themes and the mood of Final Fantasy games evolved over time. And where the earliest titles were heavily influenced by Western RPGs, such as Wizardry, uh, Ultima, uh, and the Tolkien-esque D&D roots that informed the entirety of the RPG genre, uh, which I've discussed at length before uh, in my What is Final Fantasy episode. The later games, and certainly from Final Fantasy VI onwards, adopted darker and more complex narratives and a more eclectic set of influences that ranged beyond Western fantasy, and much more into the realms of sci-fi, um, theology, uh, futurism, and so on. So this progression of the series was naturally reflected in the successive game scores, and just as an example, Final Fantasies 1, 3, and 4 all share the same opening theme, which is a very grand, upbeat, classical score that elicits ideas of friendship and adventure. But arriving at Final Fantasy VI, we have an opening score that starts with a very sinister organ and then eases into the wonderful but very melancholic uh, terror theme, which speaks to that quite you know, tense story and, and her dramatic character arc that, that she undergoes in that game story. And as for Final Fantasy II, as the anomaly here, uh, although it does get a bit of criticism these days, and I've written an essay on Final Fantasy II on my website... It was also the first Final Fantasy that gave us characters with unique identities and dilemmas to deal with, rather than generic character classes. So Uematsu was likely able to write a score that spoke to a more dramatic um, personal theme, such as Firion's loss of his family. So that's probably why Final Fantasy II is this anomaly with quite a dramatic opening theme. 
And on the note of characters, uh, Final Fantasy IV was the first game that had themes written specifically to characters and, and, and for scenarios. And where earlier games had good, albeit arguably quite impersonal themes for things like towns and royal palaces and airships, which reconciled as, you know, classic upbeat orchestrals, Final Fantasy IV had a great suite of compositions that weren't named specifically for characters, like in Final Fantasy VI, Final Fantasy VII, but more so for their circumstance and disposition. So Kane's theme, for example, is a very dissonant, disconcerting theme uh, called Suspicion, which conveys Cecil and, of course, the player's response to Kane's betrayal. And most of Kane's appearances on screen are accompanied by this tune, which really adds to the duplicitousness that's inherent to his character and his role in the story which once again wasn't able to be conveyed by expression or body language or graphics, you know, back in um, 1991. And this set a precedent which carried over onto subsequent games, such as the aforementioned Terra theme, Final Fantasy VI, Cloud's theme, uh, Aerith's theme, Final Fantasy VII, and so on, which each lends to their respective personalities and, and a personal favourite of mine, is perhaps the lesser regarded um, We Are Thieves from Final Fantasy IX, because in a departure from the dramatic thematic melodies that we have in other character themes, We Are Thieves is a fantastic ragtime track that accompanies Marcus and Blank whenever they're up to no good um, and appear on screen. And in similar fashion, we have Zorn and Thorn and their own mischievous theme, Jesters of the Moon, which I equally loved, you know, in this very kind of theatrical, musical style themes that accompanied characters in that game. So we have the character tracks, uh, and each of these speak to Uematsu's skill and eclecticism and everything from the Turks theme in Final Fantasy VII through to Vivi's theme in Final Fantasy IX, shows how broadly his influences and his skill set resides. Um, and rather than going through granular track-by-track -track discussions, I'll drop some links to the tracks that I'm discussing here uh, below. But beyond the character tracks and, and what really cemented Uematsu's repute more broadly than the game's industry is what many refer to as his main themes, or key themes. And I tend to think of them as epic event themes, uh, because more often than not, they accompany a unique sequence, or FMV. But it's here that I'm referring to tracks like Libari Fatali uh, from Final Fantasy VIII, One Winged Angel from Final Fantasy VII, um, Battle on the Big Bridge Final Fantasy V, and Melodies of Life from Final Fantasy IX. And these often signify important events battles or scenarios, or in the case of Final Fantasy VIII and Final Fantasy IX, these two tracks actually hold the core thematic melody um, of the entire game, um, and they inform much of the later soundtrack. So, the Bari Fatali, as an example, the melody in that tune can be heard in other key tracks, such as the landing, the stages set, premonition, um, and so on. And it's these pieces of music that really broke out uh, and while earlier Final Fantasies have fantastic and quite advanced scores, uh, considering the technology that they were using, such as Eternal Wind from Final Fantasy III is one of my favourites, with Final Fantasy VIII and you know the CD quality that the Sony PlayStation offered, and Final Fantasy VIII you know was introducing full chorus tracks, for example, uh, in Libari Fatali. It had singing tracks like Eyes on Me, so on. This was where I think broader audiences were able to access the music more than you you know the sort of niche of Final Fantasy fans and and video game fans and Libari Fatali as a prime example has been played n numerous times and in numerous mainstream events uh, such as the Olympics and stuff like that so thanks to things like the Distant Worlds albums um, and full orchestras reimagining Final Fantasy over the years which has actually been going on sporadically since the late 1980s but it really started gathering momentum as the games grew in repute and we've seen this appreciation for Uematsu grow beyond the games themselves and personally I remember how surprised I was back in it was about 2010 maybe uh, I was listening to Classic FM do their weekly top 10 and Aerith's theme came on at number one, which was when I really genuinely realised the cultural shift that was happening around games media and how video games had really sort of just exploded uh, as, a, as a cultural phenomenon, you know, in the mainstream. 
But um, but I bring this up because I, I just like to digress on this point and, and hopefully not come across as ranting, but it is something that has always struck me. But Uematsu's recognition by mainstream broadcasters and those that he paved the way for, uh, for example, Jeremy Soule, you know, this did not come easily and quickly for video games. And as Classic FM is the major classical radio station in the UK, I remember seeing the backlash from these apparent classical music fans at the fact that game music was entering the top 10 and subsequently for Uematsu and he entered the Classic FM Hall of Fame. But there was a huge backlash against this initially and probably still is to some degree. Um, And one person on the, the website forum, I remember, commented asking what this beautiful music was, you know, referring to Aerith's theme, which was the number one that week. And when someone replied saying it was game music, you know, the, original, the the person replied saying, oh, in that case, it's garbage. And this memory really sticks out for me uh, and it grinds my gears slightly because, to be honest, you know, for me, uh, at the age of 10, 11, 12 years old, playing Final Fantasy was basically my introduction to classical music, jazz music, and a lot of what, what might be considered complex or acquired taste, you know, within musical disciplines. And it's precisely because of Uematsu's work that I got educated uh, and I'm able to appreciate everything from Vivaldi to Mozart to Beethoven, you know, Miles Davis, John Coltrane, all, all of this sort of stuff, you know, that was that was sort of introduced to me through Uematsu. And I think what elitists in these fields like fail to appreciate is that if you don't have a broader audience listening to stuff like Uematsu and deciding that they want to learn piano or learn violin or at least tune into Classic FM to hear more of this stuff, then that audience is going to disappear. And secondly, if we actually look at some of the really renowned classical music, such as uh, Richard Wagner, um, his most famous um, opera is Der Rings der Nubelugen, which you know has classic tracks like The Ride of the Valkyries and you know various well-known tunes like that. But the narrative premise of that opera is about a dwarf who steals a magic ring from some water nymphs and then has a big feud with the gods. So it, that's comparable to the premise of a Final Fantasy game, in my opinion. And if if anything, Final Fantasy is sort of more interesting than that. So, uh, I don't know, it, that's just something that's always bothered me and this sort of trying to delegitimize composers like Uematsu. He's probably one of the most accomplished uh, contemporary musicians that we have. So anyway, um, enough of my raging against the bourgeoisie and back to Final Fantasy's excellent music. And just wrapping up on Uematsu before looking at the other Final Fantasy composers, a final quite subjective point I'd like to make is that while the aforementioned epic scores I mentioned have rightly secured his renown among fans and the general public, I'd go further to suggest that actually it is his incidental music and secondary tertiary scores that really distinguish him. And I think the unique challenge and distinction of the video game composer, as opposed to, you know, a movie composer or any other kind of composer, is that they have to craft scores that will often repeat and repeat and repeat indefinitely for as long as it takes a player to complete a given scenario, location or quest line. And doing this while keeping the music enjoyable, you know, for the player, rather than frustrating, is a task that I think very few have managed to succeed in. Yuzo Kashiro is one, um, Yoko Shimomura, who I'll come on to, is another. But Nobu Uematsu is, for me, someone who absolutely nailed this. And whether it's that comforting sound of Balam Garden or Fisherman's Horizon, or the dissonant unrest of Final Fantasy VII's Sandy Badlands or the world map, you know, he crafts these wonderful moods and worlds with his music, um, and it's impossible to sort of disengage with them and, and forget them, um, and more so than his key themes like Libari Fatali and so on. I think it's these tracks that really set him apart and, and secured his legacy, you know, in my opinion. So the next major shift in output came following Final Fantasy IX's release, um, which was the final score made exclusively by Uematsu, and in its own right, was you know very impressive and had notable tunes like Eternal Harvest, uh, The Place I'll Return Someday, and well over 100 tracks, which I think was unprecedented for a game score uh, at that time. 
And the game marked a turning point for Squaresoft, which I discussed in my Final Fantasy IX episode, where Hironobu Sakaguchi and some of the veteran team were bowing out, um, and the new merger with Enix saw Square move in, in a completely new direction. And moving on to discuss perhaps the lesser acknowledged composers, Final Fantasy X was in many ways Uematsu handing over the reins to the next generation, and I think the music team in that game was brilliantly chosen um, and is reflected in the quite unique soundtrack of Final Fantasy X, because on the one hand we have Uematsu and his co-composer Masashi Hamauzu, and for his part Hamauzu joined Square as a fan of Final Fantasy, um, and from a junior level he was brought up under the guidance of Uematsu. So from that perspective, there's a definite sense of lineage about him in the broader consideration of, of the series and its chronology. But on the other hand, we also have uh, Junya Nakano, who came to the game from a more electronic, ambient and new wave perspective. So a lot of the game's light, breezy, often trance-like feel comes from this collaboration with Hama Uzu, you know, who formed this bridge between old and new, I think. And for example, uh, Guada Salam, is a Nakano score, and it has a lightness to it, but is underpinned by trance-like synths and this dissonant electric otherworldliness. By contrast, the Besaid village theme, though equally light and expansive, was scored by Uematsu and Hamauzu, and relies on a more organic, upbeat sort of instrumental, um, and is led by the piano, you know, as opposed to any synths or, or contemporary instruments. And then finally, I think the most enduring of Uematsu's style that finds its way into the game is the battle theme, with its sharp brass instrumentals, um, you know, and the trumpets. And most of Uematsu's battle themes, you know, love the use of brass and strings in combination. Uh, and of course, his eclectic music influences also sees various other sort of sporadic tracks placed in the game, um, such as Other World, which is, you know, a heavy metal track, <laughs> because why not? Now, while Hammer Uzu would go on to score Final Fantasy XIII and World of Final Fantasy, which were excellent in fusing traditional scores with more upbeat electronic ambience, another composer I've omitted thus far is uh, Hitoshi Sakimoto and Masaharu Iwata. And much like the director uh, Yatsumi Matsuno and the concept artist Akihiko Yoshida, the, the team who work on the Evil East Final Fantasies, such as Tactics and Twelve, tend to live somewhat overshadowed by bigger names in the Square team, such as Sakaguchi and Nomura, and so on. But what these guys have consistently done is carve out their unique world and style for Final Fantasy, which holds Tactics, Vagrant Story, and Final Fantasy XII together um, as distinct entries. And, you know, I've discussed this at length in my Tactics and my Final Fantasy XII episodes, but looking at the music and Sakimoto Inawata specifically... Their compositions, like the rest of Ivalice, reside in a dis distinctly Western, feudal, and fairy tale dynamic. And just looking at the opening tune to Final Fantasy Tactics, there's more than a passing resemblance to the opening tune of Disney's Beauty and the Beast. And it's this very haunting, spidery piano piece that tells of tragedies and curses. And it's very particular to Western fairy tales um, and Western storytelling. And the opening of Final Fantasy XII is another example of this aesthetic, although in quite a different way, because what they've done here is take Uematsu's infamous Final Fantasy prelude and rearrange it with, you know, big brass and a very kind of royal feel. And it has a much more, you know, Western sort of fairy tale vibe about it. And Final Fantasy XII's tracks, you know, everything from the Empire theme through to Rabanastra, the Esther Sands, they all resound in sounds that recall ideas of knights and cavalry and chivalry and, again, you know, this sort of Western-rooted history. Uh, the soundtracks succeed very well at sort of elicit eliciting those emotions. And I think that fantasy vibe that, that Tactics and Twelve had, uh, I think there's an increasing inclusion of more diverse sounds and personnel that's been part and parcel of Final Fantasy going forward. And the Final Fantasy XI composers, for example, created a very eclectic mix of sounds, uh, residing in Celtic and archaic world music, with the track Ron Affair, for example, being popularly played in Distant Worlds adaptations. And Kumi Tanioka, 
who was a key collaborator on that game, went on to score the Crystal Chronicles games and, and tracks like First Town and Departure in those particular games really exemplify this broad influence that you know Final Fantasy composers are increasingly starting to have, you know, from from the precedent that was set by Uematsu. So, for example, these scores I've just mentioned use pan pipes and bagpipes and significantly kind of archaic Western instruments there. And then finally, you know, with this new guard, uh, we have Final Fantasy XIV um, and Masayoshi Soken, who brings his own brand of eclecticism to the table. And he's a very interesting guy because, like Uematsu before him, he has such range and draws on such a, a broad sort of genre and set of influences. You know, we hear everything from pure classical through to metal, electronic, like EDM sort of music that kind of comes through with his his uh, scores for Final Fantasy XIV. And I think it's kind of a shame that fourteen is the only one he's scored to date, uh, and I really hope he gets the opportunity to score another mainline title because, you know, I think so can... He's kind of slept on at the moment, and I think more people should be exposed to his his compositions because he is really good. So it's interesting when looking broadly at the series like this because we can really see where others picked up and ran with the precedent that was established by Uematsu from the outset, and this willingness to inch beyond pure classical and do what was right for the context and the setting and the scenario of the game world. And inching into today... The composer who has most recently and arguably groundbreakingly stepped in to score a numerical Final Fantasy is industry veteran uh, Yoko Shimomura. And while for some this might seem like an unknown, because she's someone that hasn't operated on the Final Fantasy sound team before, she has like serious clout in the industry, you know, starting off her career at Capcom in the midst of the arcade fighting game boom in the late 80s and 90s. So she worked on brands like Final Fight, uh, Street Fighter 2, the latter of which has, you know, endured uh, as one of the most renowned and catchiest sort of uh, soundtracks in, in the history of fighting games. And Shimomura later moved over to, over to Square uh, to work on story-focused games like Parasite Eve, Legend of Mana, um, and one of my personal favourite OSTs, which was Kingdom Hearts. And for me... Shimomura's genius will always be crystallised by Traverse Town um, in Kingdom Hearts because, you know, that's such a warm, simple tune uh, and it just crystallises that game for me and the sort of vibe that it has that, you know, because it's music we're discussing, it's very hard for me to put it into sort of tangible, meaningful words, so I won't try. But uh, latterly, Shimomura has been leading uh, compositions, uh, most famously on Final Fantasy XV, and even though Final Fantasy XV was perhaps slightly dubiously received by some Final Fantasy audiences, a lot of people have conceded that the soundtrack was something that really paid off for that game. Um, and it maintains a faithfulness to the sound uh, of Final Fantasy, You know, if that makes sense. Um, it's kind of consistent with Final Fantasy while producing something that's uniquely its own. And for example, where Uematsu always incorporated classical music patterns such as a waltz, which we see in Final Fantasy II, and of course Waltz for the Moon, Final Fantasy VIII, fantastic score. In Final Fantasy XV, Shimomura has kind of picked up and run with these sort of um, music patterns, and we have Waltz Fantastica, which is an epic piece of key music that Shimomura produced for this game. Um, and as I say, it's uniquely her own, but it's consistent with with what Uematsu has, has done in the past and so has this quintessentially Final Fantasy vibe about it uh, and likewise uh, Somnus is a haunting piece of music that carries the thematic weight of, of the game on its shoulders and that contrasts starkly with some of the more upbeat tracks like the Lesterlum theme uh, the Hammerhead theme and so for me Shimomura is a, is a welcome addition to the work that goes into making Final Fantasy settings and like many others mentioned here I think she carries the legacy of the series very credibly with her output to date. So there we have it, um, a short look uh, and appreciation uh, of the u uniqueness of Final Fantasy's music. And I suppose to finish up with a note on the future um, where Uematsu lives on through the adaptations and updates of his scores for the Final Fantasy VII Remake, 
and his protege, uh, Hama Uzu, who's working on that title. I think it's interesting to consider where Final Fantasy XVI and indeed the games beyond that uh, are going to go and what personnel we might see involved there. For example, you know, will Shimomura persist uh, as a key composer and component of the Final Fantasy team? Or will we see someone like Soken kind of step up and, and, and be scoring a new mainline game? So that's an interesting point to leave it on. You know, Shimomura, Soken, or perhaps someone else entirely. Who knows? But if you got this far, uh, thanks very much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed it. And if you'd like to support the channel, please consider sharing, subscribing, and checking out the links below to find out more.